what could have been uh, for a large, large chunk of yesterday afternoon, it looked like the potential of you know, maybe even a season-changing win. And unfortunately, uh, the Colts could not finish yesterday. And now they're four, six, and one on the year, and those playoff hopes continue to fade. A uh, happy Thanksgiving week. I'm Kevin Bowen, Eddie Garrison across the way. I'll start here. Uh, we will have a Wednesday pod coming up later in the week, but anybody that you know won't have a chance to listen to that before Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there. Um, yeah, I think obviously this time of year means a whole lot to many people and I feel like the older you get and the more you see life happen around you you become more and more thankful for those those things so appreciate um, everyone that not only tunes into this podcast but just safe travels and, and enjoy time with family and friends this week um, Eddie Garrison that you know again had the makings of what you wanted you got off to a great start you got the game at your pace you got the game at your score um, all those things and yet you look back on it and think, man, it's the same old song and dance of the defense doing so much of the heavy lifting, the offense not holding up its end of the bargain. Um, we'll get more into the finishing aspect of the game, but I just think when you see games like that, I'm reminded about putting teams away. Mm-hmm. And I, I think back to a game inside of Lucas Oil Stadium in 2009, kind of the iconic Patriots-Colts fourth and two decision by Bill Belichick in that game. And I have so much respect for what Belichick did with that call because it was an acknowledgement of, I respect the hell out of Peyton Manning and that if we give him the ball back, no matter where we give him the ball back, we're not going to be able to stop him. That's the territory Patrick Mahomes is entering. Right, it, certainly. Mahomes after last night, and we didn't even need to see last night to know that. But basically it was Belichick saying, let's go try and win it. Mm -hmm. Let's win it. And the Colts had so many opportunities to try and win it yesterday and couldn't get it done. And when you let a team hang around, you feel 60-minute pressure. You felt it with Washington, and you felt it yesterday afternoon. Um, And again, that just stings because – I know we have this divide in the fan base right now, but Eddie, when you're in that building and you feel the Jeff Saturday sort of momentum, I mean, you were there yesterday, you you get caught up in it, and if you're able to win and now you're 5-5-1, the Chargers lose last night, yes, you still need wild card help, but now you have a full week, eight days, because you don't play again until a week from tonight, Monday night, You're, you're the talk of the NFL. Jeff Saturday is, where's the statue? But in a results-oriented business, and for a team that's 4-5-1, and one, you're in no position to celebrate moral victories. Yeah. And that's what yesterday ends up being. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, what matters is W's and L's. Especially when you're 4-5-1. and one. Yes. You know, if you're, whatever, 8-3 and three and you're playing an 11-0 and 0 team and you compete like hell on the road, something like that, and it's a great back-and-forth game, you can kind of sit here and say, well, we'll see them in January. We'll get another crack at them. Yeah. Well when you lose and you have this record it's another reminder of you're one step closer to that offseason vacation yeah and you put it on twitter and you discussed this last week on the pod um you think nine wins will get there for the colts i had to go three and two against the eagles the chargers the cowboys the vikings um who was the fifth team on that list giants right and the giants yep. yes um, and that could that game yesterday could be the game that you end up circling when you look back on right. those five games. It's like okay, now you have to go three and one, and that and, is with holding serve against Pittsburgh and Houston, your two home games. Correct, and you have to go on the road for three of those four. Yep, that's a good point. That was the home game. Yeah, and again, juiced atmosphere. I thought it was pretty lively in there. Um, so that's what stings, and. Um, I think that's kind of the memory that you walk away from. Again, big picture for those in the draft 2023 crowd. Boy, it was a double whammy this weekend. Well, it was almost a double whammy. I guess a loss helps you out, but the Hendon Hooker ACL. Uh, I don't know. Maybe some people will be like, oh, he'll, he'll drop now and the Colts can take him. But we'll save that those topics and that discussion for a little bit later. A um, whole lot to unpack on this Monday pod. Yeah, before we get into what you did not like, I just want to say that um, – Philly fans, 
are up there in terms of the worst fans that I <laughs> if I have to hear another E A G L E S Eagles. Fly Eagles fly, I heard a lot. And that was just me walking I was just walking into the stadium. I mean, I obviously wasn't sitting in the stadium. No, I mean it was I mean it was just annoying. Like every five seconds walking around downtown back to back to the garage it was E A G L E S Eagles. I'm like, congratulations, you can spell. Uh, which you know, I mean, not all fan bases. Uh, that that's a guarantee. Um, you're going to see a lot of black and yellow in there a week from Monday too. And the black and yellow always travels. Always travels. The oh, terrible towels yeah. will be abundant. Uh, Monday night football next week: Pittsburgh and Indianapolis. We'll get into that on Wednesday. But first, we're recapping Colts Eagles. The first thing that you did not like, and I think. A lot of people did not like this, the running offense outside of that first drive. Uh, was it 7 for 49 for Jonathan Taylor on the first drive? Yes. Uh, 15 for 34 the rest of the game. 15 carry. Not like you, you you didn't give him the ball. You gave him the ball. 34 yards, a little over two per carry. And again, this is my biggest disappointment, Eddie, because it was Philly's greatest weakness entering Sunday. It was the short week. We talked about it. They did not just lose on Sunday, or excuse me, Monday to Washington. They got beat up, and you had to be able to take advantage of that. And you were outstanding in the opening drive on that. And from then on, that Philly defensive front just controlled the game. Um, It gets exasperated a little bit when Taylor has the fumble on third and one. That is now three fumbles for him this season at home. Yep, I believe all three of them on the opponent's side of the field and in very important moments in those games specifically your two biggest glaring issues all season long on the offensive line showed up again Bernard Ryman what two penalties and two sacks given up Will Fries three penalties so left tackle and right guard the two positions that Chris Ballard handed to Matt Pryor and Danny Pinter um, those continue to be massive massive problems Um, so yeah to me it's easily just the biggest disappointment because again this on paper smelled a little bit like Colt strength, Philly weakness. And it was that way mm-hmm. on the opening drive. And you're playing from ahead. You know, you can be committed to that run game. Um, and unfortunately, Philly just dominated the line of scrimmage. Um, and you know what? We can probably get into this in Twitter questions. But Eddie, yesterday was another reminder of a difference in philosophy between the Eagles and the Colts. The Eagles have had a poor run defense now for about a month, especially. And on a short week, they go out and they make two very notable free agent moves Mm -hmm. in Linval Joseph and in Dominic Sue. Both of them came in yesterday, and both of them played pretty important roles for them. Mm -hmm. Joseph and Sue were out there early in the game. They controlled the interior of the line when they were in there. Both of them played, I thought, very well. And we're talking about the Colts' 31st-ranked scoring offense. And where are the outside free agent signings for that unit? Anything on the O-line? Anything at tight end? Anything at wide out? Nope. And when you continue to utilize the same offensive personnel, Parks Frazier is not some godsend that's just going to cure all. So I thought the run game in particular just... If you were going to show me Taylor's stat line and kind of break it down like that, I probably would have said, oh, it's too much to overcome. You know, 15 for 34 over a 55-minute, 50-minute period in the game. Um, Too, too much. And again, his turnover, that's kind of been the story of the season. So I think the thing I liked the least from the game was uh, that that rushing offense. Um, For me, I want to go to the Parks Frazier play calling just a little bit here and what I did not like. Uh-huh. Just by a quick scan, I if you remove the two drives, the one at the end of the game and the one at the end of the first half, only three times did he call a pass play on first down. You want to see more pass plays on first down? Uh, more of a balance on first down because I felt like they got so predictable with the run on first down that... It was a very minimal or no gain at all for Jonathan Taylor. Puts them behind the sticks, and I think that is ultimately why that offense, kind of like what this offense looked like underneath Frank Reich, it was very stale, not very explosive because they got put in predictable situations. Yeah, I'm curious how gun-shy he got after that second series 
you know, you had the first series for the touchdown, first touchdown since Christmas on an opening drive. Then he threw it three straight times on that next series, three and out. Uh, the first throw was a swing pass to Taylor, which Philly read those swing passes really well yesterday. Four-yard loss, so you were behind the chains. That kind of set the tone for throwing it on that drive. You know, I, if we want to get into the parks element to it, um, again, I think the trend you're going to see by the end of the year is this is less to do with play calling and more to do with personnel offensively. But if Frank Reich would have dialed up a fake end around on second and goal from the five with four minutes to go in a game where the opposing team is controlling the line of scrimmage and you're expecting that play to hold up on the goal line for, what, five seconds? Yeah. Disaster. And it was almost a disaster on that play. It ended up being a disaster on third down when Ryan was sacked. But, again, that's just the play calling element that uh, you want to talk about getting cute in a goal to go situation, that was a big issue. A lot of people had with Frank Reich. That was cute from Parks Frazier there. Oh, what was the other thing that I didn't like? Uh, the ability to finish or the inability to finish uh, yesterday. Yes. Okay. And I want to make this really clear, Eddie. And I almost feel bad because we'll obviously talk about the defense and what I liked coming up here in just a second. But I think there's an element to, to any sport where you almost separate the game's. Finishing moments, final few minutes from everything else that happens in a game. I think pressure just rises. I mean, think about being at a Major League Baseball game and an at-bat in the 8th or ninth versus an at-bat in the 2nd or 3rd. I'm a huge golfer. The back nine on Sunday versus the front nine on Thursday. Yeah. Go to an NBA game. You want to see defensive intensity rise a little bit with three minutes to go in a game? You will versus, you know, 10 minutes to go in the second quarter. So, again, I want to separate what you see from so much of the game versus those chances to finish late because I do think it's a different sort of intensity level. Guys rise to the occasion. Guys wilt in that moment. Those sorts of things. Um, Obviously, offensively, you had many more chances to finish. You can point to earlier moments in the game than just kind of the end of – you know, a Campbell drop. Um, you had to settle for the field goal after the Ngakwe strip sack. You had a couple drives there late third quarter where you started, I think, like at your 40 or 45. I mean, golden field position. Um, you had a punt on one of them. The other one, or maybe it was a Taylor fumble on one of them. The other one was Chase McLaughlin missing that field goal. Um, obviously, the first and goal from the five that we just broke down, Taylor stuffed on first down, the end around on second that doesn't work. A fake end around, and then Ryman gets blown up on third down. And then the other element to finish, which I have no shame in pointing out, is your defense did have an opportunity to finish the game. And again, we'll get into what I liked about the defense, which was so, so much. And you would have signed up immediately at the start of the game to allow just 17 points, a season low for the Eagles. But Eddie, we I'm going to bring up this final drive and the inability to finish there, because had the Colts made any defensive play on that final drive, we would mm-hmm. be talking about it in a positive light. So mm-hmm. when you don't make the play, we've got to talk about it in the negative light. Um, obviously, it starts with the pass interference penalty. And the reason why Zaire Franklin is in coverage with Miles Sanders that far down the field, and the ball can be attempted that far down the field, is because the same issue we saw in the fourth quarter yesterday was the same issue we saw in the fourth quarter, the last home game. Taylor Heineke, keep plays alive, keep plays alive, keep plays alive. And yesterday, Jalen Hurts, keep plays alive, keep plays alive, keep plays alive. So that sets a tone for the whole drive. Obviously, you have the fourth and two. I really thought the Colts, if you go back and watch that, Roddy McLeod kind of makes a late check, it looks like, to whoever's in the slot. And he kind of just takes his eyes off of Hertz for just a second. That ball is snapped almost right as McLeod's making the check. By the time he reacts to the play being run, Hertz has got a little bit ahead of steam. And when Hertz meets Roddy McLeod, Hertz mm-hmm. is probably at the line to gain, maybe like a half yard in front of it. And Hertz's momentum is going to win that you know, nine times out of ten. And just his size and his physicality. Right, right. right. Um, and then the third and goal from the seven. There's so many issues with the play. My initial reaction, 
was I thought the Colts had 10 guys on the field. I was like, holy crap, this is the parting of the Red Sea because we're – I was sitting uh, is in the end zone on the Indianapolis side, uh, and it was on the other end. So uh, Hertz back was to me. Right. And so you can I mean, see it open up. You can literally see the entire field yeah. and everything from where we from where I was sitting, and um, you literally just see it go whoosh. I'm like, oh my goodness. We played the Matt Taylor Rick Venturi call of the play several times on our morning show. Rick Venturi, the color analyst mumble it doesn't mumble but you know he says in the background oh god oh like, no like or oh no or something to that effect right as the ball is snapped because he sees it he saw what you saw it i mean we all saw it matt taylor says the phrase something to the effect of like and hurts dances into the end zone that's exactly what happened on a third and goal from the seven jalen hurts could start celebrating at the two his lead blocker didn't have to block anybody his <laughs> he lead was in blocker the end was zone. the running back right he was in the end zone and so you go back and watch that play, and a couple things stand out. First, Philly does a great job of getting DeForest Buckner to rush upfield. A lot of that is an opposing offense taking advantage of the Colts' major defensive line technique and thought process of upfield, upfield, upfield. That's why I think you've seen some screens work against the Colts this year, because the D-line does get upfield so quick. So they take advantage of that. Mm-hmm. They just get Buckner upfield. That clears out an area. My second thought was kind of, where's the spy? I mean, third and goal from the seven, to me, screams short area of the field. You don't need to allocate everybody in coverage. Yeah. It's a confined area. You can have a spy. We we saw Zaire. Zaire be the main spy. EJ Spee only played one snap yesterday. So, yeah, Z- Zaire um, would have been the main spy on that play. And basically what the Colts said after the game is they the Eagles – typically only run a quarterback draw out of empty, no mm-hmm. running back next to Hurts. So they saw the running back and they thought that was a tell that they did not need to worry about the spot or the um, draw there. What I, again, and Franklin had some really nice moments yesterday and it's had a great season. I don't understand the technique there by Franklin to get his back so turned to Hurts. His back was almost in like a 45 degree angle yeah. to where he can't even feel what's going on behind him or mm-hmm. sense it. And that play or that move by Franklin, I just think immediately removed him from sensing anything, reading anything, being instinctual in that moment. It was so robotic from him. And that's how you get Hurts to waltz into the end zone. So again, this falls under the umbrella of finishing, which is a totally different umbrella than the rest of the game. It just gets heightened late. You saw it in Chiefs Chargers late last night. You see it, uh, who knows, you'll see it maybe the night in 49ers Cardinals. You see it endlessly around the NFL. The final few minutes, more attention goes into those plays because if you're able to make one of those plays. And again, the offense had many more opportunities than the Colts' defense. But the Colts' defense did have a final drive, and they got them into a fourth down, and they got them into a third and goal from the seven. If they make the play, if Gilmore makes the play like he did in the Raiders game, we're talking about it right here. Yeah. So the fact that that play wasn't made is why I feel the need to bring it up, because it's a league defined by parity, and you can't give quality teams chances. You really can't give any team chances in the NFL because, again, parity is so defined around it. Um, and I guarantee you, Gus Bradley, there had to be an element of him sitting there at night thinking, man, if we just could have finished. I mean, basically what the Colts did is they pitched – the Colts defense pitched eight innings of one hit ball. And then the ninth, they got a couple guys on base and they gave up a walk-off. Mm-hmm. And again, the offense swung and missed a whole lot, but gosh, it's just, I mean, that's now two in a row, two in a row, two score lead in the fourth quarter at home. You Just circle those two games, Eddie. I know you can circle a whole lot, but two score leads at home, those teams win what, 95, 98% of those games? Yeah. And the Colts lose both. Ironically, you lose both by the same score, 17, 16, both of them. And you lose both in regulation. You know, it's not like this team tied it and then won in overtime. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, boy, that's that's really hard to do. And, and it's a sign of a team that will watch the postseason again. That, I mean, that that's that's what it boils down to. When you don't have the killer instinct, when you don't step on the throat, 
it'll come back to bite you. Yeah, there's about uh, another thing that I think we should probably talk about is the the penalties. Eight penalties for the Colts. And early um, on, Philly had a million of them, and then all of a sudden, it really shifted. Three in a row, and that's that was half of their penalties were on back to back to back plays. Uh, but the the penalties for the Colts really were just like different making penalties. You have the hold on Ryman. I'm glad you brought that up. In the second quarter, negated a six yard run on second and seven for Jonathan Taylor, makes it second and seventeen. Colts have to punt two plays later. Uh, the next offensive drive, Colts have it at their own 40-yard line. Get an 11-yard screen pass, I think, to Kylan Granson, negated by an illegal man downfield by Bernard Ryman. Right. And then, of course, the Zaire Franklin uh, pass interference call there uh, on in the fourth quarter. And that Franklin penalty, I believe, was 39 yards. You had seven penalties for 55 by Philly. The Colts had eight for 90. So just one more penalty – but a 35-yard difference. Remember, that was flip last week. It was the Raiders that had like 40 yards more penalties than the Colts did. Um, gosh, that's the one, man. And, and you know, obviously Zaire's got to be better there. But I would like to see your pass rush not allow for Jalen Hurts to think he can make that throw and then make that throw yeah. to where it's somewhat on target. Obviously, it was underthrown a bit, but it's somewhat in that general direction of Miles Sanders. So he can get a guy out of place to be exposed in that position. And obviously it's a play the Colts have, you know, done a lot this season to where they're able to get a pass interference penalty um down the field. And of course five of those penalties for the Colts of the eight came from just two players. Yep. Two Ryman, three on fries. Yep. Uh that wraps up what you did not like. So let's transition now into what you did like. Uh Unique and Gakwe. You and I were texting about Unique during the game and I was like, that's more plays than he made in one game that he had the entire season, it felt like. And Eddie, two things. First off, the type of sack he had. You know, I'll go back at the end of the year, and Ngakwe will have like nine or ten sacks. I'd love to know how many of them are just half sacks. Yeah. Where he's kind of the second one to, to the to, to the party. Um, there's different levels of sacks. There's different levels of touchdown. You know, a one-yard touchdown run versus a 65-yard touchdown run just feels different. Um, that sack he made the first play of the second half was huge. Uh, they put Miles Sanders on him. They clearly were trying to draw up a big shot down the field, trying to get back in the game very quickly. And Ngakwe with a strip sack over Stewart on the fumble recovery. Uh, obviously, you end that drive and then boom, um, you're able to get three points. Campbell had the drop there, so you weren't able to punch that in for, for a touchdown. But it's the big moment with the sack. None of his sacks this year have felt like that one. That one yeah. felt like Mathis Freeney type of play. The other area to his game yesterday, which stood out to me, first off, they played him a lot more. They played Dio Dengbo a lot more. Part of that is to do with Tyquan Lewis and Quiddy Pay's injury situations. Um, so if Ngakwe's playing more, that means he's on the field against the run. That's not his strength. He's on the field against the run, though. And I thought he made two big run stops. He had a third and two run stop, and then he had the four-yard loss, Eddie, on the second and goal that set up the third and goal from the seven that Hurts ended up running in the end zone. But Ngakwe had a big play there on the second and goal to uh, to make the stop. So I thought he was your best player on the field yesterday. Um, you need more of this from him, and... I wanted to make sure that we singled him out because it's disappointing that it's taken 11 weeks for me to feel like it's worthy enough to kind of single him out Mm -hmm. in this realm, but that's just the nature of how his season has unfolded. You know, think about Yannick Ngakwe that makes him such a quality player is the fact that he just stays healthy. You know, a lot of edge rushers, you worry about nicks and bruises, and are they in the lineup, are they out of the lineup? I mean, hell, the Colts have felt this with their draft picks, and you look around the league, it, it's difficult for edge rushers to stay healthy. And Gakwe does that. So yeah. by the end of the year, just his availability, and, and you know, he sprinkles in the production on top of that, it gets to a level that you're like, oh, wow, that guy had a really nice season. But I think there are times during the season where you feel like, have you heard from him in three or four weeks? You heard from him yesterday. Yeah. And really, really important for a team that is doing a lot of things extremely well defensively, need more from the edge pass rush. Uh, overall, you like the defense as well? Yeah. And Outside of that final drive? 
Yeah, and that would be an understatement. I mean, again, you tell Gus Bradley, you tell Jeff Saturday at the start of the day, you're going to hold Philly to a season low 17 points. I mean, you would dream, dream of that. Um, I thought they did a nice job with the traditional run defense. I mean, Hurts got out a few times. I thought they did a nice job. Traditional run D. You know, an element, I would like to go back and look this up, because you you and I were texting about this. I really liked what uh, Stephon Gilmore did in neutralizing A.J. Brown. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brown finished with 5 for 60. In he the, had three for forty six in the first half. Yeah, I was about to say. That. So two for fourteen in the second. And those were his only two targets in the second half. Okay, I, I did not realize that he obviously was in coverage on that deep ball, Gilmore. That was a glorified throwaway by Hertz. But I think when you saw Hertz start to pick on, he, he picked a little bit on Rogers and face on there on that one drive with the comeback to Devonte Smith. Three straight times. Um, it wasn't really a Brown thing. No. And and I think we haven't seen the Gilmore shadow. I think we have a Twitter question today about like corners and, and you know which corners for the Colts should cover yes. opposing wideouts. Correct. The physicality of Brown can kind of match up with Gilmore's size. And the Colts I don't think have had that. Xavier Rhodes maybe a little bit when he was playing well, but um Vontae Davis? I thought yeah, I mean seriously, you gotta go back to Vontae that twenty fourteen season. Um I think you got to commend Gilmore on Brown and then just in general that defense. Because, you know, similar to the offense, Eddie, what were our questions exiting the Raiders game? Offensively, it was holy shit, you'd love to play the Raiders every week. They aren't going to appear on the schedule every week. That's unfortunate for Parks Frazier and Matt Ryan and that offensive line. So, how are you going to play against a better defense? Well, same old Colts offense. On the flip side of that, a question you had exiting that game from the defensive standpoint, and this is probably more of a season-long question, not necessarily the Raiders game, but entering Sunday, yeah. you had played one offense that was a top, I believe, 14 scoring offense. That was Kansas City. You know, the Raiders and the Patriots and the and the Commanders and all those AFC South teams, those aren't, you know, great offenses, you know, above average offenses. So how would you play against a legit offense? The answer? Pretty darn well. Yeah, pretty darn well. So, um, this defensive unit, again, has to be commended. You separate the finishing from the overall performance. They continue to do the heavy lifting, and it's a shame because they've played like a January-type unit. The offense has not. The offense has played like a, when does the XFL start? February? (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so we'll go late February, early March. That means XFL. That's what your offense has played like this year. I saw Chad Kelly won a CFL title yesterday. Oh, boy. Don't start this. That? Don't start this again. Swag Kelly. Would you rather watch Chad Kelly, Matt Ryan, or Sam Ellinger quarterback the Colts to end the year? Is this a legit question? <laughs> legit question. I'm throwing to Eddie Garrison. I need you. What are the circumstances? <laughs> right now. Right now. You got a long week. Chad uh, Kelly can be signed. Who do you want to see under center for the final six games? Ryan Ellinger or Mr. Swag? Senor Swag. Well, considering some of the upcoming defenses, uh, I would rather see Ellinger. Boo. Give me Swag. Come on. Hey, you're going to face some good edge rushers coming up, right? Yes. You've got TJ Watt coming up. You've got Micah Parsons. Everson Griffin, um, Zedarius Smith, Zedarius Smith, and then um, we'll see the health of Thibodeau. the Chargers. Yeah, Thibodeau. We'll see the Chargers' health. Still got Khalil Mack and though. Khalil Mack. Yeah. Uh, one final thing before Twitter questions. I don't think we gave him enough love to Zaire Franklin uh, and what we liked. Twelve tackles, a half a sack. Yeah, I know. He, forced he, fumble. Yeah, he had a huge. The, the the left-handed punch was outstanding. He had a big spy. Um, sack on Hertz that got them out of field goal range. And maybe that's why I'm just so stunned by the third and goal, Eddie, because it was so uncharacteristic of Zaire. Yeah. Again, just how – I'm sure it's a technique thing and it's way over my head, and, and but it's more of just he turns his back so much to him that, like, in such a confined area, you now have eliminated reading any sort of tell from Jalen Hurts. Yeah. On a day where you, no, of all people, forty four has been the spy, mm-hmm. and it just it was probably confusing more than anything. Again, I thought the Colts had ten guys on the field. I literally thought they were missing a linebacker. 
I'm like, whoa, I'm literally doing the, I, I'm counting them as they're running off the field, or, or as they run towards the extra point. I'm like, is there a, le- was there 11 out there? And by the way, what was Sirianni doing on the timeout at the two minute warning, trying to draw them off sides on the fourth and two? Did you understand that? I think that's what he was trying to do, yeah. Why? It was fourth and a very long two. There's no way you're going to sneak it in that situation. By you calling that timeout, now you've eliminated the, if they stuff you on fourth and two, the game's over. You only have one timeout left. Yeah. Or if you had two timeouts left, you could still get the ball back with like a minute-ish to go. That one, hmm, confusing. Uh, Final, final thing, I promise. The one thing I wish the Colts would have did on that final drive, I think they should have started with like a draw or a yeah. run. Get a little couple of yards, get the offense going a little bit, make it a little easier instead of trying to force the ball down the field to Alec Pierce there. Was it uh it was the second play, was that the big one to Campbell? Yes. Yeah. And then Deion Jackson, the dump off. Was there anything sadder than the fourth and twenty one dump off and then Deion Jackson getting out of bounds? It's smart to get out of bounds in that situation. Saves clock. <laughs> I mean, God, I, I, like, what? Oh, my God. Seriously. So, Campbell for 14. That created a first and 10 from the 39. I mean, 50 seconds to go, first and 10 from the 39. At that point, you're thinking 20 yards? I mean, you have a you got a minute 20 when you take over the ball. You had one timeout. So, that was then Dion dump off out of bounds, and then that was when Matt Ryan was under siege. Where um, uh, Reddick got Ryman. in his, Reddick got in his area on second down. Ryman got bull rushed by Brandon Graham on third down. Yeah, and again, that's the Ryman question mark. Speed rusher is a little better. The question mark, and Brandon Graham is a thicker rusher. Think of him like Justin Houston, a little more power guy. Yeah, that was the question of Ryman, the tight end turning to tackle. How would he handle the power rush? Wow. Yeah, and then Will Fry's false start, and then check down on fourth and twenty-one. Are you ready for Twitter questions yes, now? Yes, let's do them. Walter is up first. He says he heard Nick Sirianni's post-game interview, and he spoke pretty passionately Ooh. about Frank Reich and his belief on if he should still be coaching. He also said he spoke to a few players after the game, and do you think there was a lot of negative talk about the state of the team? They have played harder the last two games than they have all season long. I think Frank Reich is a great person, but he never really seemed to have the team ready to go. They played from behind a lot, and the play calling became stale. Hard to say, but we seem to be worse than we were last year. I just hope the players are really buying in. Walter, I appreciate the question. I'm glad the Sirianni topic got brought up. Um, Eddie, did you you were at the game. Did you catch him by chance at the end? Did you see any highlights? I saw the highlight on Twitter. I did not see it from my point of view on the, in the stands. Nick Sirianni... And I love passionate people. I think listeners of this podcast know this. I love I love some fire. Sirianni has it. And what you saw at the end of that game, he was yelling at Colts fans, and then he, he's like shaking hands. I wouldn't even call it shaking hands. He's aggressively shaking hands with like Colts staff members after the game. Yeah. And like, I mean, these Colts staff members have got to be like, I mean, they get it. They just realize that that probably just killed any sort of playoff chances they had left. You know, obviously you're you're mathematically still in it, but now you got to go on a crazy run to end the season. And Sirianni's high fiving them pretty much, like he's he's on their staff. I'm like, God, Nick. Oh man, what I saw was this: I saw an incredibly passionate individual that loves Frank Reich and would love to give a middle finger to Jim Irsay. <laughs> That's exactly what I saw out of out of Sirianni. Remember, Frank said all along that he's thought about whenever I become a head coach, I want Nick Sirianni to be my OC. Yep. Nick Sirianni's resume was not this like star-studded resume. I mean, he was not like I don't think he would have been an OC, you know, in the next necessarily two or three years, just automatically. So obviously, he's very grateful to Frank Reich, and you know, we we talked with him on a conference call last Wednesday. I knew he'd be pissed off, and I knew you would see emotion out of him, and you saw a lot of it. But I think more than anything, the venom is towards Ursay, and 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 the benching of Ryan. I would say that's where the post game comments from Sirianni saying he talked to Nelson, he talked to Campbell, he talked to Kenny Moore. I, I think I'm forgetting a player or two. He talked to some guys after the game, and Nick pretty much said that I won't share their thoughts, 
But, you know, he kind of threw one of those in there. I would like to think and assume that those comments are more players being like, yeah, man, Frank got a raw deal. The owner stepped in and just fired him. Mm -hmm. Or, I should say, wanted Ryan benched. I think that's where the player chatter is. I don't, to Walter's point, I think the players are buying into Jeff Saturday really, really well. And clearly, they've led a seven of eight quarters. Yeah. I mean, the fourth quarter of, and they've gotten off to much better starts. Um, But that was just a Nick Sirianni wanting everyone to know that the issues are deeper than just coaching for the Colts right now. Yeah. Uh, You know what? I, I thought it was. I've got no issue with how Sirianni react. I mean, was it a little bit too much, this and that? And I know some people are making kind of memes out of it of like, <laughs> this is how a guy reacts and coming back to beating a 4-6-1 and one team or 4-5-1 team. That is his friendship and love for Frank Reich on display. And it's he feels like his guy should have got a better deal. Colts fans can disagree with that. No issue. Yeah. Just trying to explain what I think Sirianni is coming from on that. Plus, he said after the game that he loves the, you know, he loves the city. I mean, started his family here. Yeah, one of his, yeah, one of his children born here. Uh, yeah, lived up in the Westfield area. I mean, yeah, and he's a, um, you know, he's a dude that, to those that kind of side with the NFL players, gravitate towards a coach with a little bit more fire. He's an example of that. Mm-hmm. And you know what? And we'll get into this more maybe during the bye week or early on in the off season. But Eddie, when you're looking for the makeup of the next head coach. How about Nick Sirianni realizing in year one, oh boy, play calling's too much and doing it all else. Yep. He decided during that first season, it's too much. I need to put this on somebody else's plate. And if you look at their record since then, it's one of the best in the league, if not the best in the league. Yep. Uh, Matt is up next. Uh, I can't help but watch this game. They're currently winning 13-3 to at the moment and still think they are better off with Sam Ellinger as their quarterback. I think the ceiling is severely limited with Matt Ryan at QB. I watch this offense and I don't think they can win a playoff game. It pains me because this is the best defense the Colts have had in years. Lastly, even if, the, even if they win... Uh, with Matt Ryan, there is still the uncertainty of the future. The only positive seems to be the locker room morale. What are your thoughts? Yeah, Matt, I, I had a similar thought. Don't you love the end game questions? The thirteen to three. I love that he throws that caveat in there. But yeah. thirteen to three. But this is what I'm thinking right now. Uh, uh, in all seriousness, I I appreciate that, Matt. You know what yesterday was for me, Eddie. Along with a lot of other things, it was a reminder of what a mobile quarterback can do. Mm-hmm. Now, Jalen Hurts is very mobile. And I think you guys have heard me say over the years, the Colts don't need Lamar Jackson. You know, like, I get that those guys don't grow on trees. Just subtle movements in the pocket. Escapability. Escapability. Mahomes. Third and six. Exactly. You watch Patrick Mahomes run. He's not going to win a 40-yard dash between, you know, five, six quarterbacks in the NFL. But he's a guy that can do things off script. And that is what, ultimately, you would like to have. Um, I don't know if you felt this way watching it yesterday, but when the play lasted longer than two seconds for Matt Ryan, I'm thinking, oh, God, this is not going to end well. Happy feet. When the play lasted longer than two seconds for Jalen Hurts, I thought, oh, God, this is not going to end well for the Colts defense. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, sums up everything about the element that that QB can bring to a team. Go back to the Dane Brugler comments, and I will say this phrase, and I apologize, but I will say this at least two dozen times between now and late April. Dane Brugler with us um, on the podcast a few weeks back. The quarterback position of the NFL is no longer about being a passer. It's about being a creator. Mm -hmm. You've got to create. Hertz created so many times for them yesterday because in Ryan's case, he's confined to being a passer. So if anything is not perfect around him and that pocket starts to collapse just a little bit, jittery to your point, happy feet, whatever you want to call it. I mean, you can f- see him like panicking. Without question. Without question. You, it might sound bad. You just see his age very quickly. Yeah. You, you just see it very quickly. And it puts so much stress and pressure on those around him offensively. Whereas with Hurts, you don't necessarily have that. You know, it, it's... If things are breaking down a little bit around him, he can still Houdini his way to make a play. And again, I know he's a very gifted runner there. Um, 
you know, Matt Ryan right now, he's your best option when you promise clean. You know, when you can offer that, he's more accurate. He's a better processor than Ellinger Mm -hmm. to, to, to those points. I don't see Jeff Saturday, certainly not in the next two weeks. I mean, you got two weeks till you're by. So it goes again Steelers Monday night at Cowboys Sunday night football. God, it's crazy. Three of your next four are prime time. And then uh, you got to buy, and then you end with those final four Vikings, Chargers, Giants, Texans. I can't see Matt Ryan getting benched again, to be honest with you, but I especially can't see it in these next two games. Maybe if you lose both, you sit down during the bye week and you reassess, but. Yeah. I can't see it. Uh, Drew is up next. He has a question regarding Jonathan Taylor and says, what's wrong with him? Why is he fumbling so much this year? Can it be justified to move him in the offseason? Yeah, three fumbles this year. I would say, similar to kind of the Ngakwe discussion earlier, Eddie, uh, on the flip side of it, it's the timeliness of these fumbles. I mean, these are second half, opponent side of the field, at home, and we probably notice them more because the offense isn't good enough to overcome them. You know? Um, Had the one in the Commanders game, right? In the red zone? Yeah, Commanders game. And uh, was it the Titans, the first game here? I feel like that I think was the so. other one. Um, so I looked it up. He's had three fumbles this year and 147 touches. Last year, I think it was four fumbles and like 370 touches. So obviously he's on pace for a much higher number if that were to continue this season. Um, you know, is that justifiable to moving him? I think there, those things are all areas you can point to as leverage in contract negotiations. I'd be mm-hmm. stunned if they tried to move him. Stunned. I, I would think that they would give him a second contract. But again, I think you need to look long and hard. Just like the Nelson discussion with his contract this offseason, if I were the Colts, I would have played up the leverage of three surgeries in nine months. That, that's worrisome, and I think that's contributed to a bit of his regression. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Taylor, I think you got to point to these fumbles. And he's not a third down back either. So I think that can add to it. I'm going to skip down a couple while we're talking about Jonathan Taylor. This is from Jason. He says, maybe I'm being too harsh, but JT is not a generational talent. He is when he has an elite or an above offensive line. Uh, above average offensive line, but not an average to slightly below average O-line. Can't pay him above market money. He has flaws that get overlooked because of last year, including meh pass protection, not even including the fumbles due to the number of carries. Jason, that's a really good point. Um, I would counter with this. Can you be generational at running back? I don't think in today's NFL you can. And I guess let me let me go here. You can be a generational talent, but I don't think that generational talent can be seen every Sunday because of the position that you play. Like I mean, Saquon Barkley is a unquestioned freak of nature. Christian McCaffrey when he's healthy. Right. I mean, they are freaks, but so much has to be on display around them that I just don't think you can showcase that as often. So the fact that you're that I'm saying those things, then Derrick Henry. That impact, yeah. It doesn't that impact how generational of a contract you should be giving them mm-hmm. if you want to continue down that path. And then you know the point I was making a few minutes ago about Taylor, the fact that he does struggle at times in pass pro, and again he's just not a third down back. That I mean Barkley is much more of a gifted receiver. Uh, Christian McCaffrey, of course. Alvin Kamara, of course. Uh, I would think that would impact some negotiations as well Cameron is up next he says two great defenses two struggling offenses the difference one quarterback able to make a dynamic play when it mattered and one who can't if Chris Ballard doesn't draft a quarterback in the first two rounds of the draft then how are we supposed to continue to root for this team it's such a handicap boy handicap that is that is really the right word here I think I've said this before, but Eddie, the path the Colts have chosen to take at QB, it, it creates a ceiling. It defines a ceiling for yeah. you. Um, I would argue it defines more of a long-term ceiling for you, but I also can hear from people that are like, when you go short-term, you're running the risk of growing pains within a short season. 
And if you have those growing pains, and I mean, look at the slow starts the Colts have annually got off to yeah. with these new quarterbacks, that adds to it as well. So, um, yeah, Cameron, that's that's the right word. And, and I don't know. I I mean, I've, I've watched a lot of college football, and obviously I've covered the Colts now for about a decade. I don't know if I've ever seen a college football injury occur on a Saturday that had more people tweeting at me than the Hendon Hooker torn ACL from Saturday night. Yeah, I didn't even see that. I was watching, um, I had Pacers that night, yeah, that's Pacers why. Yeah, Pacers magic, huh? Yeah, yeah. So I didn't get to see the injury, Yeah, I, I did see the news. Yeah, I feel awful for him. And I am, um, I'm a guy that, I like Hooker. The age doesn't scare me as it would at, at other positions, so you feel terrible for him. Uh, but it just kind of shows you where you're at as a franchise, where, again, a college injury to a guy that is probably not going to be a top-10 pick and probably wasn't going to be a top-10 pick has a fan base buzzing. It just it, it shows you where you're at at that position. And I just think how the urgency is now spread throughout the fan base. You know, it was always there to some degree, but now it's even higher. Uh, Daniel is next. He says, hi, Kevin. Had a quick question for the next pod. I'm a big fan of the pod from London. Ooh, Daniel. Love it. Been to London. Beautiful. Have not been there. Uh, so I, I can't say it's beautiful. It is. Pictures pictures look good, though. I will say that. Regent Street, great time there on that uh, Friday before the Colts-Jags game in 2016. He says it's been a while since he's asked a question. He says this is clearly a playoff-level defense uh, that is let down most weeks by the offense, and there's hardly any chance that the Colts make the playoffs. His biggest fear is that this team ends up around 7-9-1 and one and are too far down to make a quarterback to take a quarterback and end up in the same situation at QB this time next year. How many wins do you see the Colts getting the rest of the season and bring on England versus USA on Friday? Daniel, huge on the pitch this Friday. Go, go, USA. Eddie, I I love I love the World Cup. I really wish it was not during the NFL season. Yep. Uh, because it'll get lost in our news cycle here. And I think we've had this discussion before but it fascinates me that the united states men's soccer team is not very good Mm -hmm. compared to the rest of the world yeah so i am very locked in cannot wait for that on friday as we record this we're about three hours away from the uh match against wales which if you look at the group england just dismantled iran earlier today uh that is a big one it might it almost seems like the winner of the u.s wales match will move on yeah, from the limited knowledge I have about Wales, they seem like they're a good yes. team uh, well, or a good club. Yeah, most even group it looks like if you average out the four teams. Yeah, uh, most even group. Um, you know, t- to the draft order. I mean, Eddie, you're four, six, and one, and right now you have the 14th pick. I, I it's shocking to look at how many teams have three wins right now in the NFL. I, I feel like every team has three wins or like seven wins. Um, so yeah, the Colts right now are slotted 14th. That probably adds to it. Now, we should point out the Colts have not had their bye yet. So there'll be a week where everyone else, of course, in the NFL is playing. The Colts do not. Basically, 75% of the league, or maybe even more than that, have had their bye. So those teams that are at 3-7 and seven right now, they're going to get a chance to play another game, which obviously you would hope a few of them win for the Colts' sake, and that will help them out. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. You know, I know I've said it on this podcast before, but watching Sunday, I'm thinking to myself, man, Frank Reich was a big Jalen Hurts guy. Chris Bauer was not a big Jalen Hurts guy. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So many questions, not enough answers. Seven, nine, and one. So that means what? Three more wins? Steelers, Giants, Texans. Texans? Do you think they can beat the Giants on the road? Well, I'd start with the Steelers. You know, what worries me, if I were a Colts fan, I think the early line's two and a half. Mm -hmm. I mean, assuming these guys are healthy, Cameron Hayward, Mike Minka Fitzpatrick, and TJ Watt can all go make, they can all go create points themselves. And the Colts offense will probably give them chances to create points. And did they, didn't they just put up 30 yesterday? I don't know, is Pickett coming into his own? Or is that more of a defensive putting up 30? I think a little bit of both. Oh, boy, 7 to I mean, Steelers game is no gimme by any means, but yeah, I'll go with 7. 
Uh, Garrett is up next, back-to-back pods with a question. Um, If you were evaluating the offensive line for next year, how many of the starters would you like to return next season if you had the mobility to re-sign or cut anyone on the roster? Feels like most of the problems this week came from ineffective line play and quarterback pressure at the wrong time. P.S. I appreciate Eddie's skiing suggestion on the previous pod, (laughs) but now I'm back in Fort Wayne for a bit, so I'm not sure if that's possible. I will say, I don't know if you're into this or not, Garrett, but curling. There is a curling. Really? Yes. I don't know what the proper phrasing of this, but I know there's a place in Fort Wayne you can go curling. Wow. Um, Screw soccer. Curling's a world's game. Right. Uh, so it's wintertime. Curling is curling is in up there um, in Fort Wayne. He also says, have an excellent Thanksgiving. Uh, same to you, Garrett. And thank you for that. And Eddie, great work on the suggestion. Uh, this is a good question. What will the makeup of the O-line look like next year? Um, they're all under contract, right? I guess Pryor's not. Ryan Kelly's going to be the big decision. You know, can Danny Pinter be bad? I just, boy, I thought Linval Joseph and Sue, I thought they controlled controlled the interior. What's crazy is, among others, they both played less than 30% of the snaps. I know. But, you know, and I, I'm going to save I'm gonna save that for, for another question. Anyways, uh, Ryman, you know, what do you do with Ryman? Is he the guy of the future or no? Another huge question. I would be looking deep into the free agency class for a left tackle and or a right guard. Well, left tackle, the only notable name is Orlando Brown. There's only three other available tackles. So, yeah, I, I think if you could find a starter at guard, bump fries to the bench. You know, again, do you go with Pinter over Kelly? I think that's a decision you got to make. I wouldn't be opposed to, I mean, drafting another tackle early. And, you know, I I get that you spend a third rounder on Ryman, but it's November 21st, and I don't want to say any more about the draft because I don't feel like I'm, like, very educated on it to speak a whole lot to it. Mm -hmm. So I'll probably withhold, and I apologize. I know people crave draft content. Um, and I want to look at the Colts' needs a little bit more and, and, and just draft depth. But nothing I've seen from Ryman this season would all of a sudden mean tackle should be off the board. Yeah. I guess that's where I'm going with it. And and I'm one that, like, there was development. I mean, the dude played two years at Central Michigan of tackle. Like, I fully acknowledge you drafted him to say there's going to have to be growing pains if and when you decide to play him. And boy, are the Colts feeling it. And boy, they felt it yesterday. Four questions left. Mitch is next. Uh, Jim Irsay said Jeff Saturday is working to simplify things for the players. I'm pretty sure Tony Dungy did the same thing in 2006 when the team went on skids late in the season. Is there a chance Jeff is applying a lesson from his old coach? Here's to hoping Rosie and Max let you sleep in this weekend. Really enjoy the pod. Mitch, I appreciate that. Rosie Bo, Max doing terrific there. They did let you sleep in a little bit yesterday. They did. They did. Um, Can they make it two straight weekends? Boy. That, with that no is, work on Sunday. That is no chance I'm betting on that one, Eddie Garrison. Maybe with your money. <laughs> uh, no chance I'm doing that. Oh, I appreciate that, Mitch. You know, as far as the question, I asked Jeff this on, on Friday because simple is a word I've heard from him a lot here in the first week. And I said, now that you're in your second week and you've had more of a calm week, a calmer week, I should say, does that allow you to maybe tap into a little bit more that's not just simple? And he's like, oh, no, no. Simple is always going to be a word you're you're going to hear from. A counter to that that popped into my head, though, would be when you have seven Hall of Famers like they had on that team, it's a little easy to be simple because your players just you, – you, you do what you do so well that the talent just wins out. Yeah. And with Manning and Edge and Marvin, and by the way, for those that didn't watch it, find the Football Life Edron documentary, must watch. Just an awesome, awesome watch. Edron James is the man, simply. He's the man. Go to our website, 107.5thefan.com. You can hear his interview with JMV from last week as well. Thank you for plugging that. Yes, Edge was terrific with JMV. Again, uh, 107.5 The Fan. But, I mean, think about it, Eddie. They just had so much elite talent, again, at critical spots, too. So I think being simple for them is a little bit different than now, being simple with this personnel. Um, 
but I certainly get the thought. And, and I do think there's an element of you don't want guys overthinking and all of that, but boy, it really helps, man, when your talent is a lot better than I think the current group group is. Uh, and if you're watching or listening on YouTube, you can uh, go to the videos page, and it's up on our YouTube as well. Um, is Eddie Garrison doing it all right now. Uh, Wake Spike is next. Uh, we witnessed another Colts loss, and it made me recall a Chris Ballard quote from 2018. I'm paraphrasing here because I can't find the exact quote. He just wanted to point that out. Uh, he says, if we draft this high again, I'm not doing my job right. As much as I'm pulling for a high draft pick, do we really want him around to make the decision that will shape our franchise for the next decade? Or is this just a result of an overly improved, involved owner, not improved? Yeah, should he make the quarterback decision is a really, really interesting debate. Um yeah, I think this quarterback move is unlike any other the Colts have had as an organization in eons. And I don't think a miss on, you know, veteran quarterback all of a sudden means that, like, oh, the Colts can't evaluate quarterbacks. Or Chris Bowd is a horrific evaluator on quarterback. I, again, I, I've heard that, you know, he wasn't very high on Hurts. Um, I just feel like. Again, I continue to come back to this. If Jeff, Sa- if Jeff Saturday wants to be here, he will be here. And I would think he would have more of a decision. I know scouting isn't necessarily what he's doing right now, and scouting isn't necessarily um, maybe something that he wants to do. But I just I have to think that, I don't know, maybe he would look at Ballard and say, no, man, you have the voice, and I, I, I trust you and what you want to do. It's quite the decision to make to kind of pass off on somebody else. Yep. Um, I look. I, I've got questions about Ballard, certainly, but I'm not sure if this is one of the ones I would put in the con category. And I know that might sound like me carrying Ballard's water, but I can't sit here with confidence and be like that man has no idea what he's doing in identifying and drafting a quarterback. It's such an unusual decision. It's so unique. It's different from any other you make throughout the year. It's an extensive, exhaustive process that includes so many people and so much background and so much development, which is out of the GM's control largely. Um, I don't know. I mean, he was early on in the Mahomes identification. Does that matter? I don't know. Would he have spoken up and said, trade up 25 spots or whatever they did to take him, which they ended up doing? I assume he had some say early on in being like, this this is a pretty special talent. Um, but then, if you see how he's operated here, it's been a lack of urgency. Trading back. And wanting to make that, that sort of move. So, I don't know. I feel like we're in a mode right now that we just write Chris Bauer off with every move. Yep. And, and with this one... I understand reasons for concern and all of that. I think it's a great question by Wake Spike, and I apologize for not having more conviction one way or the other. Uh, once again, the Colts were watching or scouting uh, Will Levis. who I, I didn't watch a ton of the game, but I, I heard he had some nice moments against Georgia. Yeah, he came out uh, right away. He made a, a hell of a throw. You know, it was Blanketed coverage with the cornerback for Georgia on the left shoulder drops it over the right shoulder of his receiver I mean he flashed a little bit but just too consistent uh, but I know he's dealing with a multitude of injuries that right. they've been pointing out um, so I don't know if that's impacting his play or not but uh, there were moments on uh, on Saturday where Levis looked like he could play on Sundays now, that's just my quick analysis of what I could see now are we tanking for uh, choke Lose for Levis. Choke I, I, for Caleb. Do you start that a year early for Caleb Williams? Listen, I think Caleb is special. I mean, what he can do with the football is. God, I'm I'm worried about my Irish right now. Are you? Yeah. They have to go on the road, don't they? Saturday night, man. That'll be a good one, though. Saturday night, man. Um, I was gonna say something. Oh, your point about Chris Ballard and Colts fans seemingly writing him off. It's very much like. The uh, Indiana Pacer fans from you know two seasons ago or a season ago with Kevin Pritchard and yeah. questioning whether or not 
he's the guy that can draft and develop or draft talent. That's a really good point for the future. And now you look at the Indiana Pacers and winning winning games right. when nobody thought they would. And Pritchard had some huge misses, you know, and several years of them during the draft. But yeah, that is a good point. Uh, two questions left. Adam says if. Chris Ballard is the general manager this offseason. Will he change his free agency approach given his draft capital? Hopefully, is directed at a quarterback. And Matt Ryan will still be with the team and wanting them to be competitive. Uh, interesting. This is certainly a one I haven't given too much thought to. As far as the free agency involvement, investment, uh, whatever by Ballard, I'll believe it when I see it. I feel like I've talked myself into it. Yep, <laughs> in recent off seasons, um, and that of course is not unfolded that way. Um, you know, one thing I was reminded of watching the game yesterday, and this goes back to a point I was making a little bit earlier. A common phrase I hear from Chris Ballard is, "Roster building is twelve months out of the year. You find guys at all different points in the calendar." Now, I would argue that, similar to the Black Friday deals that everyone will encounter here later this week, that's your best opportunity to get deals many times. Well, your best opportunity to get top-end talent in free agency is in the month of March. And I don't think um, that avenue has been explored and used enough in under Ballard's watch. And I bring that up because... He says 12 months out of the year. Eddie, what did we watch Philly do this week? Brought in talent. They went out. They addressed a weakness with two very notable names that both came in and instantly helped out their football team. The Colts are the 31st ranked scoring offense in the NFL. They have had, I believe that's now six games this season where they've scored a touchdown or less. So they've played, what, 12? Four, six, and one? 11. They've played 11 games this season. They've scored a touchdown or less in over half of them. And where are the outside free agents in season? Again, roster building's 12 months out of the year. At O-line, at wideout, at tight end. You know, I'm Thursday night football. I'm watching Austin Hooper as a veteran tight end make some big plays for Tennessee. We mm-hmm. saw it here. Um, I f- seemingly watch Amari Cooper do it every single week with Jacoby Brissett in Cleveland. Now he gets Watson back, and that was what like a fifth round pick, sixth round pick, something like that. Mm-hmm. So I, I just again, I think it's I think it's more more personnel than anything offensively, and. This is a guy that is often preached 12 months out of the year. We can find guys in season. I mean, I think back to like the Odell Beckham rumors at the start of this offseason, or I think just in general, Eddie, it was maybe more the white opposition. And basically, he said something to the effect of like, we'll get a few games into the season. If we feel like we need to make a move, then we'll make a move. First off, I don't love that tone because I think it diminishes the start of the season. When you've had such poor starts to the year and you got two road divisional games out of the gate. Yeah. I just think it sends a bad message. And clearly, I mean, the wideout group, Campbell and Pierce, have done better than I th- certainly thought. Exactly. Yeah. The first two games of the season would not fall into that group when Pierce had a huge drop week one. Week two, you have no, no Pittman and, you know, Campbell as a number one. It's just not something that. No Pierce either, right? Concussion? You, you, you would want. Yeah. And at that point, I thought it was probably still early to, you know, give Pierce that, that, that sort of role. But. Um, as the season's unfolded, I mean, we're almost to Thanksgiving. And I mean, think of outside the building free agents this team has brought in this year. Gilmore? Right. I mean, in season. Oh, you know, in I, I, season. I mean, My you know, bad. And again, I'm talking offensively. You know, when you, I mean, Dennis Kelly at the start of training camp, like, you just haven't done anything yeah. with the O-line, tight end, or wide out. And... You've fired the OC, you've benched the quarterback, you've fired the head coach. At some point, how much of it is just personnel, man? It's almost like um, 
like when you're in the NBA season, I, I keep making these comparisons, but not strictly to the Pacers and like your Oklahoma City Thunder, you know your team is bad. You know you have a stud in Shea Gilgis Alexander, but what do you have in Josh Giddy? What do you have in Trey Mann? You know, what do you have in these young guys? And they've gone to the the aspect of we're just gonna leave these guys out here and let them develop no matter what the cost is, despite all the preseason expectations of winning the AFC South and getting back into the playoffs to host a playoff game. To me, that's just what it feels like. The, the, you feel like they're siding more with the young guys? Yes. That yeah, the, I just, uh, I don't, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but again, like that element doesn't necessarily check the box of let's support the 37-year-old, 15-year vet with as much win now around him. I mean, that's what made the Bucks the Super Bowl winner. Right. That's what made the Rams a Super Bowl winner. And when that stuff starts to erode around those guys, you're seeing issues in both of those areas right now. Um, doesn't doesn't make sense to me. Uh, final question comes from Jay. He says, hey, KB, pod question, which corner, Isaiah Rogers Sr. or Stephon Gilmore, would you like to see match up on the remaining top wideouts for the rest of the season? In Pittsburgh, you have Deontay Johnson and George Pickens. Dallas will have CeeDee Lamb, uh, possibly Odell Beckham Jr. They for sure have Michael Gallup. Uh, Minnesota, they have Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen and TJ Hawkinson. And then you have the Chargers with Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, and Joshua Palmer, who developed last night. Um, And then... Nobody really with the Giants. Wide out and pass rusher, man. That's what you're going to see a whole lot of coming up to close out the season. It's a great question, Jay. Um, and, you know, Eddie, I thought Sunday developed how I kind of thought it would with Gilmore getting more of that A.J. Brown assignment, Rodgers and Faison getting more of the speed guy and Devontae Smith. Um, and I thought Gilmore did a really nice job. I would like to see more of that, so kudos to Gus Bradley for that. You know, Deontay Johnson, George Pickens. Did I see Pickens get canned late? Yes. It was stupid. Yeah. Onside kick recovery. Tyler Boyd's already on yeah, the ground yeah. and yeah. straight. I've heard some wild stories yeah. about Pickens. Uh, Gilmore on Pickens? I would and say so. Rogers slash face on a little bit more on Johnson. I just think in general, the physical, the wide out, the more physical, the wide out, the more you have Gilmore. On that guy, mm-hmm. I do think when you get in a late game situation, Eddie, if the other guy's kind of hurting you, you know, if more of the speed guys hurting you than the physical guy, then maybe you would slot Gilmore over there. Uh, but that's kind of how I I would operate with that. But it's a really nice feeling to have where you feel like the Colts have a couple corners that um that can make plays in those in those situations. Uh, I agree with you there. Any final notes? I do not. As comments? I said, to lead off the pod. Again, thank you to everybody that's continuing to listen to this podcast. Um, and watch on YouTube. Can't forget about and that. And watch on YouTube. Uh, Eddie and I really appreciate all the loyalty and support over the years. Um means a lot. And so for anyone traveling this uh, time of year, safe. And I uh, hope you enjoy the pod to help you out here. Uh, we will be back on Wednesday afternoon. Again, uh, kind of a extended week for the Colts with a Monday nighter coming up with Pittsburgh. So next week we'll have a Tuesday morning podcast recapping the Steelers game. But we'll be back Wednesday with an abbreviated pod to get you set. I have a final thing here. I, if you're still listening at this point, thank you. Um, before Wednesday's pod, I want to have a little fun with this. So tweet at Kevin or tweet at me, at Eddie Garrison underscore on Twitter, or tweet at both of us. And give us some of your abnormality Thanksgiving foods that Ooh. you love. Outside of, you know, the usual stuffing. Yeah, normal, the usual interesting. Turkey and things like that. What are some of the unusual Thanksgiving foods that the common person may not consume that you view as a staple of your Thanksgiving meal? Whether that's breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I like it, Eddie Garrison. And it's got me hungry. Yeah, me too. Um, He is Eddie Garrison. I am Kevin Bone. Everybody have a great week. Again, safe travels if we uh, don't talk to you uh, the rest of this week. And, uh, yeah, happy Thanksgiving. See you.